welcome to Marketplace in Action. Giving you hope for your goal and purposes. Breaking down the words to uncover the promises that God has for your life. Building your faith for those promises. Good to see you. This is Marketplace in Action. As always, I'm Dr. Ken, as your host, and with me as always, Evangelist Anthony. And today, I'd like to start off with, and I thought this is a real good subject for the first of the year, and let's start out. The lust of the flesh, and I want to start with the first sin in the Bible, which is actually lust of the eyes. Where when Adam and Eve were in the garden, what happened was, and you know the story, you can look it up for yourself in Genesis, it talks about how the, all those beautiful trees they had there, and they only lusted after one, the good and evil, the tree called good and evil. So here's where I'm going with this, is what are we really watching out for? And what do we really see? And let me give you a, a start of this. It's 1 Corinthians, if you're taking notes, 924, and I like to use the Common English Bible but you can use any one that your heart desires. But in verse 24 it says, don't you know that all runners in the stadium run, but only one gets the prize? Key word is one gets the prize. So one run to win. Now back in those days, they had the Olympians back then, and it was an, actually from an olive branch. It was a crown that didn't last very long, and that's the point. They would run to win something, and all they would do is get that crown, and it would disappear quickly. But see, here in verse 25, and this is where I want to go with it, it says, everybody who competes practices self-discipline, and that's what I want to talk about part of today, is self-discipline. I hope this helps you. That the runners get a crown that never dies. So let's begin. What if everything we pray for and, and the question is, if everything that we pray for and we actually find out why we didn't get it, think about it. Everything you've always prayed for, you prayed for that new house, that new car, that new special uh, soulmate, whatever it was, if you got everything you've ever, want, uh, ever wanted, I mean, if you didn't get it, do we give up is my question. Of course, the answer is no. But let's turn it around. What if you did get everything? This is what I want to talk about today. What if you did get everything you're praying for? Would that fix the problem, you think? Yeah. Let's find out. Let's start out with keys. This is wisdom key number one. I want you to realize this. That you might want to take notes. Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. Acts 7, 49. So that's how big our God is. So let's take it from there. God never asks us to understand his ways. He only asks us to believe his word. So as humans, it's our nature. Now watch this. With all the technology we have, we try to understand. We naturally seek and understand before we'll believe. So what are we looking at? But the faith seeks to believe before we understand it's simply because we never understand anything as Christians in faith. We just, it's meant to under, uh, the faith is just meant to understand, period. It's simply believe. Example, children don't need to understand. They just believe. It's in Mark 10, 14, and 15. It's translated to put it this way. Unless the kingdom of God is simply put, if you don't get to simplicity like in a child, You'll never get in. So I'll bring in Evangelist Anthony. Doesn't that sound a little harsh if we're not like children? I mean, don't we have to know what, what's going on? Or You would think, you know. And With the technology? You're a technology guy. Totally. And, you know, all this technology and knowledge, we, we're on such a quest, Dr. Ken, for, for knowledge. Yes. And it seems what we're trying to now with the CERN particle colliders and things, we're really trying to... Science and, and kind of the supernatural are, are merging. 
and we're trying to figure out all these how the wor wor world works and how if there's a God and how, how he interfaces with us. And we're trying to find all these things. But then again, the Bible, just like you were saying, the Bible talks about faith. Mm -hmm. And it says you either have faith to believe, but we're not going that way. We're going the way with knowledge right. and trying to believe with knowledge. And I think of people that are always like, well, if I just, if I had the knowledge or if God revealed this to me, God, if you show me something and I'll, then I'll believe in you. If that's our attitude, then we're probably never going to see anything. Because think of the disciples who were with Jesus. They were with him all the time, seeing miracles. And the Bible is full of their testimonies on how they still doubted. They saw God's miracles and God working, but yet they still didn't have the faith. So it, no matter how much we know mm -hmm. and all the knowledge, we're, that still does not replace faith. And that's, that is what the ultimate battle is, is... Those who have faith and those who don't, those who go by knowledge. And so what you were saying about, you, you know, lust Good. over the eyes, it's what are we driven by? If we just, well, if I just knew a little bit more, then I could understand what's good, good and That's bad. Good. The last thing I'll say is it seems like good. we're stuffing ourselves full of the tree of knowledge of good and evil so we can fill. You nailed it. So we figure out what is good or bad when we're completely missing that there is another way, the tree of life. Which is, the, which is faith. That's excellent, sir. Children don't have to comprehend in order to trust. Let's go from Isaiah 58, 8. The Lord says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. My ways are beyond anything you can imagine. So the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, in Hebrews 11, 1, you already know that, faith proceeds as a real fact but it's not revealed to our senses. So if we don't choose, we don't get to choose when or what or to understand why we're in a windstorm, for an example, like Anthony said. Example, let me give you a, a quick thought in Acts 16, 17. You guys already know the story. Paul and Silas started their second mission trip. They were strengthening the churches. It's from the... Um, uh, Europe to Asia, uh, a demonized lady, a girl, I guess it was a young girl, started following them around and started mocking them. And I'll cut to the chase in verse 18. Paul couldn't take it after the second day and finally delivered her. But the problem was, and I want this is where I'm going with this, and I want you to show how, what are we really looking at, is the parents were so upset because the little girl is the one that gave fortune telling, and that's how they made their money. So she took Paul and Silas to court and accused them of not being able to make their living because the girl was delivered. So what happened was Paul and Silas was jailed, but before they were jailed, watch this, they got whipped, and I don't mean whipped like, you know, the, uh, the Jewish custom was 39 lashes was the most, depending on how severe it was. This is well over that. Uh, Paul addresses it in Corinthians that it was he was without measure. So I can imagine maybe 40, 50 times. But anyway, the point is they got into the jail and they put them to make it worse. They put their feet in such a way that it made it so uncomfortable that it actually cuts off the circulation. In those days, they could literally lose a limb because it was so bad. But watch this real quickly. They started singing right after now, think about this now. Come on. Here you're, you did nothing. You helped the girl out. You got her delivered. And all of a sudden, you're accused. You're in jail. No matter what you say and do, they've got you locked in. It looks hopeless. You're jailed for life. You're whipped to death. You're beaten to a pulp. I mean, you're finished. But they start singing. Mm -hmm. And what happens? We know the story. And, and I want to show you. Let's start there. I want to give you wisdom key number two. Matthew 25, 14, 21, it says, The law of increase, use what you have faithfully, and more should be added to you. So they started singing and praising, even though it wasn't exactly the right timing. But my point is this, serving Jesus doesn't mean it isolates us from hardship. As a matter of fact, it looks like God has abandoned them. But could we sing, I don't know if I could, sing through something like that, I mean, could you sing when you lost your job or 
your marriage is on the rocks or you got sick or the business is crumbling. I don't, you know, it's such a touchy, I mean, when you're lonely, you're abandoned, when you're rejected, can you still keep singing? No, I, I, you know, it's, it's tough, but that's not why we sing and praise God. It's because the wonderful work that he does, but who he is. And I want you to keep that in mind. I believe in miracles. I've seen a lot of tumors disappear, cancers, damage, limbs grow out. But I'll tell you this. In some thoughts, it's hard when we ask God and we're praying to him. This is what I'm going to get at is when we're asking for our business to succeed and they fail, or we ask for a better salary and we get fired on the spot. I mean, has this happened to you? We pray and we're asking for healing and we're still on the deathbed. It's a contradiction. But sometimes our experiences that contradict our faith is the one that's going to bring us closer. Now, I want to bring Anthony in. How many times have you heard this? I mean, what are you looking at? We hear leaders tell us in those situations, as Paul did, and by the way, as Paul and Silas began to sing, the chains fell off. Not only did he deliver the jailer, the jailer was going to kill himself, but he sent deliverance to his whole family and salvation. So that's the best part of the story. But, I mean, think about it. There are men of God that are going to do a task. You would think God is with them, and that's where I want to start at today is you hear leaders and pastors telling you if you don't get your prayers answered, I mean, what are you looking at? It's you don't have enough faith. You're, you have sin in your life. Anthony, you know this. We don't plead the blood of Jesus. We don't put the armor of God on. We're not sowing enough. That's my favorite one. So some of those could be in our prayers, but could it be our theology? Yeah. Uh, a lot has to do with the way we behave it has a lot to do with our opinion of who God is and what we think God is. And if we think that God is, you know, just this God of blessings and he wants all people to be happy and equal and everything, it's then we're, we're going to get we're going to feel a little entitled, like God owes us something. And we go around like kind of even upset at God. It can turn into resentment like, God, yeah. you were supposed to answer this and you didn't. What's up with me? What, what am I doing? And, you know, Pastor, Dr. Kind, it's so, I was talking uh, to a guy this very week. He mm -hmm. uh, found me and, and wanted to talk about God with me. He's not a, not a Christian. And uh, we talked for a long time that morning. And he was saying, man, my parents have been going to this church. And the pastor just says, you know, God is good no matter what in all situations. Praise him no matter what. God is good. And he's like, I don't understand how that relates to my daily life. Mm -hmm. How is that supposed to? That's good. And I told him, I go, it's not. You know what? No matter what your situation is in this very moment, we could have had horrible past with with abuse and rape and lots of horrible things to us. But in this very moment, right now, how are we going to respond to the future? Because that can change our mm -hmm. entire course. And if we're going around acting like a victim, thinking God wasn't there with me and all this stuff, then. Our, our life's going to get harder. But if we're going around, even in the midst, say, you have a car crash and you're abused and all this stuff going on, start praising God and say, God, thank you for what you do have. You don't have to fake it. But he spares our life. We are here. We are That's alive. Good. We are breathing. You're watching this. You have a TV or a computer. You are blessed. You are in the position to where you can help others. It's time to say, I'm to stop being a victim and say, I'm tired of trying to find help from other people. What can I offer other people? What has God given me that I can share with other people that are less fortunate? And our whole life will start to change when we really, we say, God, you are God no matter what. If, if I have blessings and everything I ask for, I'll praise you. If I have nothing and end up in a concentration camp, I will still praise you and still thank you for all these blessings. But we can't fake it. It has to be real from the heart. And I pray every day that I would be able to praise God in any situation. Well, I want to add to that. That's excellent. Maybe we're not taught to line up with God's will, but I'd like to say this. It's a, if we... It's, it's like having the combination of God's promises. We think it's, you know, he's a genie. Mm -hmm. It's, dear saints, whatever you like, punch in this code and I'll give it to you. It's, that's not the theology. Can I give you a thought? Write this down, wisdom key number three. Because of our desires come from our heart, this is the third wisdom key. 
hear what God say about the heart. This is what God is speaking. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's God saying it. So think about it for a second. Do we trust our own heart? What is our hearts so wrong that, you know, why wouldn't we think our hearts are right when we always choose the wrong woman or man or work for the wrong company or our hobbies or our pastimes oh. aren't in line with God's thinking or we're hanging out with the cool friends that aren't so cool? Sometimes we want to do the right things for the wrong reasons. Think about that. Right, right things, wrong reasons. I'll come back to that. But grant us the desires of our heart. It can't be if he truly loves us. Think about it. Hmm. For an example, if there's James as a salesman, I'll just arbitrarily pick the name James. He's the top salesman. He wants to be a manager of the company because the manager's retiring. He's got all the ability. I should get the promotion. It's God's will, right? You would think. But what if? He works so much and he gets it. God knows. We don't. So what if he works too hard and long? It suffers his family. His wife ends up leaving him or the kids get sick and don't need his attention or they run off. Think about it. Or Barbara. She's in a new association with her new uh, friend, Rod. She's been believing for a godly man. He's got all the attributes. He's strong for God. He believes in missions. He wants to travel the world. But she's praying for her husband. Is this God's answer? What if he gets sick? And she has to take care of him for life. Hmm. Our desires sometimes originate from our soul. So we base our desires on things that we see and perceive with our limited senses. So I want to ask you, again, Isaiah 55, 8, my thoughts are not your thoughts. The Lord says, my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. Watch this. Your desires are often misguided. You have ever glad that God did not answer your prayer. Think about it. I am. We think sometimes in Jeremiah 29, 11, we know God's thinking of us. For I have true thoughts, I think, towards you, God's saying. The Lord's thoughts are for peace, a future, and hope. So we know God wants hope for us. He wants a future. He knows he has good things for us. But Sometimes that word thought means vivid design. Now watch this. Think means to weave in or to plan. So God is really saying, I have vivid designs that I have weaved in hmm. to the plan that I have for you. That's good. God rarely shares his thoughts. Have you noticed that with us? I know I have. But if he answers our prayers to every wish and hope, wouldn't he be a genie? Wouldn't God... Wouldn't you be the God instead of him? But when he acts like God, because Jesus promised, I'll comfort you from trouble in spite of it. That doesn't mean from trouble, but in spite of it. Jesus is saying, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me, he said. That's in John 14, 1. So whatever happens, we have to be guarded, our heart. If we don't guard our heart, we can sometimes get offended with Jesus. And that's when there's a whole different uh, thoughts and possibilities. But Anthony, would you read us? I think this is quite clear how God thinks of us. It's in the Message Bible or whatever Bible he's got there. It's Romans 8.37. What does that say? 8.37. I'm in the CEV version. In everything we have won more than a... Wait, let me start over. In everything we have won more than a victory because of Christ who loves us. I am sure that nothing can separate us from God's love, not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, and not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from God's love for us in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's excellent. So I want to say two things real quick before we close. Paul writes, not only so, but we always glory in our sufferings. Write that down. Glory in our sufferings because we know suffering produces, this is what suffering produces. And, and if you read in Hebrews, the heroes of faith, what they had to go through, we're going through nothing. But it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character brings hope. Romans 5, 3. Let me say this. Hope cannot live without 
The heart cannot live without hope. It's oxygen with the soul. Hope is important to our very existence. Let me challenge you with this, Matthew eleven twelve. 12. We all know this one. The days of John the Baptist. By the way, he was the greatest messenger of all, the greatest prophet, Jesus said, of ever being born on this earth because he prophesied the Lord is coming. He knew the timing. So the, violent, the kingdom of God is violently attacked as violent people seize it. Key word, violent people. Write that down. I'll come back to it. Therefore, in the history of the kingdom of God, we're advancing it with forceful, this is the violent people, forceful, spirit-filled people that lay hold of it. It requires force, effort, work, perseverance, diligent. It's not for the wind. So, but we have to be careful. Remember when I talked about those pastors and lead and Anthony jumped in on sometimes they well-meaning, but for the wrong reason. We have to be careful as strong uh, individuals. Sometimes our greatest strength is our biggest weakness. Let me explain. Forceful people sometimes get a little off track and lead people. Remember, the leaders, we have to be very careful. We have to look at Christ first and pray for wisdom and stay on course. So I want to invite you to every other week we're on at 4.30. I would like to invite to, and Anthony will give you our website, to see what you're looking at. What are you looking at? What do you think? Please email us mm -hmm. at... Email us at our website. You check it out, marketplaceinaction.org. Right. Check us out, and you can email us from Let there. Let us know your concerns. Let us know what you're believing for. Let us know what we can pray for you. Let us know what we can talk about in the future. Because remember, the marketplace is all about finding your calling and your purpose in Christ. But one of my main passions is we also have to walk through the Word to find out the principles to get through the daily situation from taking you to the ordinary to the extraordinary. extraordinary. So until two weeks from today at 430 I'd like you to invite you back to see us again. But until then, email your request. I don't care if it's for healing, if you need a prophetic word, I don't care if you need prayer or a teaching on the subject. From this point on, in the next two weeks, we're going to bring our website up where you can actually see the tips that we're talking about on each particular program and what you can do to generate the, the proper... Uh, words that you need to prophesy your story. Now, I'll give you one scripture real quick before we close. It's Ezra 6.14. It says, through the prophetic ministry will prosper, meaning if we'll get God's promises, remember God promises, it's in Hebrews 1.14, angels hearken at God's word to bring those promises forward. So Isaiah 55.11 says, if we do not faint and we will, the word of the Lord will not come back void. So if we use his words, the Bible words and prophesy victory, it can't not come to pass. So until next time we get together, I want to wish you a safe and prosperous weeks to come. And remember, look for the Lord first, first in all things. Don't look at your circumstances. Don't look around you what people are talking That's about. Right. And, you, and Acts 19.9, it doesn't matter what people are, are talking about you. That has nothing to do with it. You have to put your trust in God. Right. Until next time, Dr. Cannon, Anthony. Evangelist Anthony, God, God bless, bless you guys. You. See you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you.